I'm Michael Fox, the publisher of the Prospector News, and I am on location at the Current Trends in Mining Finance conference put on by the New York chapter of the SME. And I am privileged today to be sitting across from a Canadian Mining Hall of Famer, Rob McEwen of McEwen Copper. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Mike. Glad to be here. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you. We uh, we were able to do this last year at this conference, and I'm glad to have you back. Um, I'm amazed at the progress that you've made on your copper project uh, in Peru and everything that's uh, going on there. It's exciting. It's such a different way of doing things. Uh, update everybody about that project and uh, and the progress that you've been making in the last year. All right. Well, I'll just have to correct you on the uh, geography. We're in Argentina. We're below Peru. You know, I'm I'm one of these people who take the names off the maps. I can't find anything. <laughs> well, we're right on the border with Chile, and Peru's just above there. Okay, um, sorry and, about that, Argentina. <laughs> don't worry about it. It, but just mentioning Peru and Chile, they produce together forty percent of the world's annual production of copper. So it's a very important part of the world to be in if you want to have a copper mine. Um, Argentina, when it, if the projects in the province in which we're in came online, and there's two others in a, in adjoining province, Argentina could be producing almost as much as Peru on an annual basis in the next 10 years. Oh, that's exciting news for that country. So it, it, it's big. Um, so uh, our project, we put out a preliminary economic assessment, an updated one, in June of last year, and it envisioned a mine, um, an open pit heap leach mine that would be producing for 27 years, and that would only be mining less than 40% of what we, the estimated resources. It would be producing in the first five years, 400 million pounds of copper, and then over the life of the mine, averaging about 320 million pounds of copper a year at a cost of $1.07 a pound, and, which is quite attractive given copper is about $4.70 right now. Um, that'd be the cash cost. All in would be $1.65. So I like to look at this deposit and think of it in the terms of it was a gold equivalent deposit because of my exposure to gold. Of course. So if you were to take the gold price divided by the copper price, you'd come up with a number of the number of pounds of copper that would equate to one ounce of the value of one ounce of gold. And you do that and divide, use that number to divide it into the 37.6 billion pounds of copper that's contained in our deposit. You end up with a gold equivalent of over 70 million ounces, and which is pretty big. That, that's, that's a huge deposit. And that at 321, taking the average production, that's over 600,000 ounces equivalency. And at $1.07, that's under $600 an ounce cash cost. And all in sustaining is $1.64 times that factor. You're at about $850 all in sustaining cost. So that is a big gold deposit in my book. And to give you a, another reference, that 70 million ounces is equal to what the most, one of the most prolific gold districts in Canada has produced in the last hundred years, the Timmins Gold Camp. This is a massive deposit. We had 22 drills on site. The, the drill season's just ending right now. Since we did the preliminary economic assessment in June, We've done 100,000 meters of drilling with these 22 drills. Uh, we'll have um, updated resource in the fall coming out. We don't expect much change. Most of the drilling was to increase the confidence in the resource. So moving from a, an inferred to an indicated and measured. And we really wanted to define what we call the payback pit. So the initial capital is considered to be just under $2.5 billion and the payback period of three years. Uh, uh, that's remarkable that you can turn $2.5 billion in payback in just three years. You were the first, uh, it's a function of grade. The first 
five years, we'll be mining 0.6.7% copper. And just that higher grade uh, contributes to that low. And a low strip ratio. The strip ratio is 1 to 1.6. 1 wow. to 1.16. So it's very, it's not a bad strip ratio at all. No, not at all. Uh, there's there's a lot of copper miners out there to be enviable of this uh, of this position that you've, you're finding yourself in. Uh, you mentioned about the drilling. You had some results that came out uh, about a week ago. Um, they were to confirm this pit. Is or was, some of it was to confirm, and others we had done some exploration. And on the south end, we've found mineralization seven hundred meters beyond that sh pit shell that we had for the PEA, and four hundred meters north of the pit shell. So that's about a that's stretching the dimensions by about 20%. Um, it, the, the drill holes at either end are newer, so we have to do more drilling there to comfortably say that you might have just expanded the deposit by 20%. And then we were doing some reconnaissance three kilometers away on the other side of the mountain and found copper oxide and veining similar to what's at Los Azulas. And uh, we have a drill hole in there. We don't have the assay back. The geologists were excited by the visuals. And then they found a very large footprint, about five kilometers long when they were doing their sampling. A lot of Somali molybdenum, which is doesn't move as much as copper. So it's usually associated with copper. So you might have the potential of another one of these on the other side of the mountain. Yes. That's uh, that's scary good, isn't it? Indeed. I had, for those that are, uh, can't see, Rob just had a beam with a big smile. Um, copper is definitely a place to be in. Let's take a look at the, the macro view of, of the copper markets. Uh, hit uh, all-time new highs last week. Um, and a lot of people seem to think that it's still got some uh, some room to grow on the upside. Well, it appears. I mean, if you look at all the, well, most of the projections are saying there's increasing demand because of the energy transition and there's not the supply to make it up, whether it's from recycling or production coming on the stream. A number of the large mines that have been around for many years, their grades are declining and their production profiles are falling off. So um, that would suggest that for a while going forward, we'll see strong prices in copper if you were to compare your projected mine with uh some of the major mines that are out there where, where would your your comparison be well i'll start with the size of the resource uh, mining intelligence said that we were the fourth or the eighth largest undeveloped copper deposit in the world right now and that if you took out the deposits controlled by the majors, we'd be the fourth water, just not owned by a major. In terms of annual production, we'd be in the top 15%. That's uh, that's good news for, uh, for you and your investors. Yeah, well, I mean, take the current price of copper and 400 million pounds of copper. Um, you're looking at just $1.9 billion a year in revenue. And you have a um, dollar seven on that, um, you've got a huge spread yes. between four seventy and a dollar seven. Yeah, no, definitely, and a very yeah. nice margin, gross margin. Yeah, definitely. Argentina itself—it's—it's it's always been a, a strange country politically. Uh, they seem to have a a, a new leader. Uh, I I saw pictures of you and him uh, beaming with thumbs up all over social media a couple of weeks ago. So you, you've met the new president. What's he like? And what do you think that means for, for mining and, ec and economics in that country now? About a month ago, I met with him for an hour with some of my other uh, members of management. First 20 minutes, he, he spoke about what he wanted to achieve in Argentina. And that's essentially attracting foreign capital to strengthen the economy, uh, create a lot more jobs for the country, strengthen the peso, cut back the inflation. And specifically, he was looking at 
freeing up the foreign exchange. So if you invest in the country and take your profits out, it's a lot more. Right now, it's very difficult to do that. Um, lower the tax rate. Put a stability agreement in place so that you, if you're going to put the money in, you're, you have more assurance that you're going to be able to keep that asset. And a whole slew of other items that would make it easier to get permits, easier to process, um, just speeding it up. He's an outsider, an economist by training, a believer in small government, and that uh, the way Argentina was run in the past was not well. No. So, um, yeah, it was quite an engaging conversation. He's very serious about it. He's gone along and he was saying that his popularity was, say, X at the time he got elected, and now it's X plus two or three. Um, so he's gone up in popularity. Even though inflation is running around 200%, he's posted his first quarterly surplus. The IMF has advanced him another $4.7 billion because they like what he's saying. And there are, a number of, there are a number of majors just taking a look at Argentina and saying, look, Chile and Peru are very well mineralized. Argentina is, but the government in the past didn't really permit the development of mining to the extent that what's gone on in Chile and Peru. Yeah. Um, they don't have a producing copper mine right now, but in 10 years, if all the deposits in the province of San Juan, where we are, came in, as I said, now you could be starting to rival Chile's or Peru's annual production, which is 13% of the world's annual production. Yeah, well, that'd be a good uh, step towards the uh, the needs for the electrification of our travel and uh, and everything. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, it, it would be huge. And that Malay is, yeah, I, li I like what he's doing. I was a fan before he got elected. I liked him. He, he's he's very knowledgeable of the social media. And I'd have to say that it was, I believe, the youth of Argentina that elected him, the young voters, not the older voters. Interesting. Yeah, there's, I, I think we're uh, like even like we're sitting here in New York today. I think you're going to start to see that even in U.S. politics, that the younger voters are going to uh, start to uh, to step up and make their thoughts known a little bit more. They're tired of electing old men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, they're screwing up the economy. Yeah. Well, the old ways, you know, sometimes have to go go away. But uh, I'm going to make a strange analogy for you. But this is how I viewed Argentina. Um, I like wine. Everyone raves about Chilean wines. They are very good. But you know what? I have found that Argentinian wines to be just as good as the Chilean wines, but nobody knew about the opportunity to, to get them. And I kind of see mining in Argentina in the same way is it's just as good as their neighbors, but the, most people overlook the, the opportunity there. Uh, is there more opportunities in, in Argentina for, for McEwen Copper? Well, certainly if we have another deposit on the other side of the mountain, yes. I'd say we have our hands full right now. Not that we're not looking elsewhere, but I'd like to see these get going up in production before casting my eye too far afield. Yeah. It's, it's really important to be focused on this task and delivering it for a couple of reasons. One, distractions can drive you off your point, but two, what we're trying to do in Argentina, I see as a model, one of the models that the future of mining could be, where it's much more sensitive to the environment, it's much more attractive to the local communities, and it, it's altering the game. And it's all about trying to change the public's perception of mining to a more positive view. And what we're doing, proposing to do there is very different than most mines being built today. Uh, absolutely. I'm, every time you speak about what you're doing, it just blows me away that, uh, first off, that somebody thought of doing it in this fashion, and then to actually, you know, be following up and actually doing it. So can you elaborate on how you're doing things differently in Argentina um, and and why you've taken these, uh, these routes uh, to, to show the industry how it can be done differently? Happy to. Um, two years ago, when I gathered all of our engineers, project managers, and manage, senior management, I invited an architect to join us. 
an architect who is considered the Steve Jobs of the green living building space. A fellow by the name of Jason McLennan. He lives on Bainbridge Island, just off Seattle. Um, has done a lot of work with the tech industry. And they said, Jason, I want you to help us redefine mining because mining has a very bad reputation with the majority of people in the world. And we have to go at it differently. So he's done a, a lot of work that would be considered regenerative. So he sat down with us and we started working on it and came up and we said, uh, water is an important issue. How do we reduce our water? Well, all right, let's go heat leach rather than flotation, reducing the concentrate. That also got rid of the tailings dam that would have been filling a valley and have a dam face that's over a thousand feet high in a region that is seismically active and sitting at the headwaters of a tributary that goes to the main river to the capital. Gee, what could go wrong with that? <laughs> So I went, you know, Brazil's not very far away and there was a huge tailings dam break there. We don't want to be viewed as that type of threat for the community downstream. Then I said, I've always wanted to have a mine that looks like a jewel on the hillside rather than a scar. And so Jason was working with that. YPF, which is a major power company in Argentina has offered us so they can provide us electricity from renewable sources. 100% renewable, and that'd be solar, wind, hydro. So we're looking at an electric fleet um, and trying to electrify as much as possible. The region of San Juan has a very high solar radiation, so solar cells, is, um, it's a good way of collecting power. Then we looked at the water and how do we ensure that we're using the least amount of water because there's agriculture downstream that uses it. Jeep waste waste their, their practices, flood irrigation, leaky canals. Um, and I said, well, we're going to have the uh, work with the agricultural community to provide infrastructure that helps them manage their water more prudently. And then it's also the, the mining industry is facing a shortage of people to work in the industry. We have uh, a good portion of population nearing retirement and actually going into retirement. And at the end, at the other end of the spectrum, there's no one coming into the industry. The opposition to mining has done a very good job of discouraging most students from not going through schools of geology or mine engineering. So you have this shrinking workforce. And yet we talked about it earlier on this demand for metals increasing quite dramatically and the supply being unable to meet that demand. So we're gonna need more people in the industry. How do you attract them? You've gotta make a mine site very comfortable. So we're looking at a, a terraced accommodation where we're growing our own foods, where we're processing our own water. Um, it's powered by solar. It has gardens, hanging gardens in it, um, and very comfortable. It sounds nicer than my hotel here. Oh, it is much nicer than one I'm in. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, it, it, the image of it, hanging gardens and uh, working on the atmosphere, because we're up at 10,000 feet. So we're up at 10,000 feet, and we want to deal with the right amount of oxygen in there so that the workforce is rested and operating. I mean, some of the copper projects and in the province or one has the top of it is base camp everest i mean you just ah. you just can't work there very easily so we want to make our place one of the first choices for them to come to we'll be producing cathode copper green cathode copper that companies when if they are looking at the their supply chain where is the green in their supply chain we can provide them a product right there. It doesn't have to get exported. It doesn't have to get shipped to a smelter. It can be used by industry immediately. It'd be in London, LME grade. This is all a brilliant, brilliant thing. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining me. This has always been a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, hearing more about this project as it rolls out, and uh, and we see uh, copper prices continue to rise, and 
the profitability gets uh, stronger and stronger for you. Well, thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> thank you. I'll gladly accept that. <laughs> The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.